This is Professor Gavor. We're covering parts of Chapter 7 of the OM5 book. We've already covered the material in the SEM Principles book, uh, the online book that we're using in previous lectures, uh, so I'm going to skip those parts. You're free to go back and look at it. It's just another perspective of what was covered and will perhaps give you um, an expanded view. But in order to make this lecture brief, it's good to just skip ahead. All right, we want to start talking about capacity planning a little bit. I mean, you build a factory, and whatever the product is that the factory makes, it can pump out so many things per hour, week, month, year. And that's called the capacity of the factory. And, and if you're running at one shift or two shifts or three shifts or four shifts, four shifts tends to be a 24-7 operation, three shifts is five days a week. Eight-hour shifts, uh, the fourth shift being, you know, utilizing the weekend somehow. You can also utilize the weekend using overtime of the other two shifts, other three shifts. Uh, but you leave time out for... Um, equipment maintenance. You don't run things 24 hours. Uh, there's time lost during the changeover from one shift to the next. There is uh, obviously a lull in some of the production or diminishing of production when you have lunchtime and then you always have people on vacation. you got to account for all of this. So capacity. How much do we need to make? How much do we... and that's usually based on how much we think we need to sell. If... Uh, the demand is greater than the capacity, well, we're leaving sales on the table. We're, we're limiting our revenue to what it could be. So we would want to then maybe expand the factory. So those are the kinds of things we want to talk about here. So capacity is like an upper limit or ceiling on the load that can an operating unit can handle. It's based on equipment, space, and people. Well, the goal is to achieve a match between long-term supply capabilities of an organization and a predicted level of long-term demand. So, yeah, we want to meet our demand now, but we also want to meet our demand in the future. If we're over capacity, operating costs uh, become too high. You know, there was a, a saying we always used to say in warehousing that you don't build a church for Easter Sunday. You build a church for 70% of the Sundays where you know you get the average amount because if not the church is going to be cavernous uh, you know 50 weeks out of the year and, and packed at Christmas and Easter and then what do you have uh, you've, you've wasted money and you've got to heat that big building etc under capacity is even worse you're straining your resources possible loss of customers and if you're always Cutting orders, which under capacity means you're, you're, you're not meeting your demand, you're leaving, as I said, revenue on the table. So one of the questions we ask is what kind of capacity is needed, how much is needed to meet demand, when is it needed? And, uh, of course, there's related questions to that, very important related questions. And maybe the first one is how much will it cost? Uh, what are the potential benefits and risks? I mean, if you're adding capacity, what are you doing? You're expanding your factory, you're building a new factory, you're replacing an old inefficient line with a more efficient high production capacity line. Um, you're duplicating a line that produces a, a, an item with a similar line. And you have to guess, do you want to like duplicate, if you're building a new factory, uh, in addition to your current factory, you better well expect demand to double. Or you end up like General Motors and Ford, which closed a lot of factories as their, as their demand dwindled. Um, should capacity change all at once or through several smaller changes? In my uh, experience, it's always better to do it in phased amounts if you can. Because one of the things we talk about this, how much will it cost? That means you have to go through the capital budgeting process. And they want return on investments of anywhere from a year to two years, probably averaging at 18 months. 
And if you build the church for Easter Sunday, that then that Easter Sunday is coming two years from now, and that will be the norm. Well, you're going to have a hard time meeting that ROI. But if you do it in phases, like you build the building bigger, but you only put, you know, occupy 25% of it, and then expand to 50%, expand to 100%, or maybe you build a small building with a designed or already designed for expansion. So are there sustainability issues? Yeah, sure, you've got to ask that. What are the environmental impacts? And if you're building, if you're expanding, can you do it for less energy and less uh, environmental impact, less carbon footprint, all of that stuff? Can the supply chain handle the necessary change? Uh, you know, what is the plan to keep production going while you're bringing everything new online? So capacity decisions tend to be a little bit more strategic. And usually in most companies, especially in consumer product companies, um, the, the, the three years is a strategic decision. One year is a tactical decision. Uh, anything more than three years. So what's the impact uh, of the ability of the organization to meet future demands? affect operating costs, one of the major determinant of the initial cost, how often or you know you have to involve the, a long-term commitment of resources, it can affect your competitiveness, it can affect the ability to manage. Uh, yeah, these are all important, but really what you're trying to do is say, do I think my business is going up? Do I need to expand? And I need to expand before it's a really pressing need and I'm cutting orders. That's really what you want to try to do. And then you have to navigate all that and manage it well. So here we're getting to the meat of it now. We want to define and measure capacity. So we look at two things, design capacity and effective capacity. So we want to measure capacity in units that do not require updating. Uh, we don't want to measure it in dollars. Uh, and it's asking why is that problematic? Well, county people love dollars. They like to measure inventory in dollars. Uh, if I'm in operations, I don't inventory dollars. I inventory units, and units take up physical space, and they have weight. And I, I want to be able to make those decisions. We handle units. We make things in operations. That's what we want to do our capacity on. It's not based on the dollars. It's not problematic, but... It, we're talking about units. We make things. We have to measure it in things. So there's two things, design capacity and effective capacity. This is the maximum output rate or service capacity an operation process or facility is designed for. This could be your 24-7, seven-day-a-week operation. You, you've spent millions of dollars on machines that make up a production line. And you're saying, how much can we crank out maximum if we had to? And this is based on, when it says design capacity, the people that are helping you, you're buying this equipment from, you're buying the line from, will give you that rating. If everything, if the machines are all functioning smoothly and there's no delays and you have all the raw materials available at the right time in the right quantities, then you can produce at this rate. Usually they built in some preventive maintenance because preventive maintenance is better than waiting for a machine to break down because if a machine breaks down, usually the, the breakage or whatever the part wears out that causes the machine to have to stop and be repaired may cause ancillary damage and therefore be more expensive. So most manufacturers will tell you beyond regular um, lubrication and, and those kinds of things. Let's replace the bearings every blah blah hours of operation. Let's replace the cutting edges on, on mills and uh, the drill bits uh, every so and so so that we know that if we do these things, let's re if there's um, rubber belts that drive things and gears, how often do you have to look at them? How often do you have to replace them? Gears don't require uh, replacing hopefully ever if you properly lubricate them and maintain them. If so, this, that's all important. 
So you're not really going to ever run 24-7. You know how you see that, oh, Canvas will be down this Sunday from um, 3 in the morning to 5 in the morning. That's maintenance time. That's when they take the system down and do things to it. It's a computer system, but the same principle applies. Effective capacity is the design capacity minus the allowances such as personal time and additional maintenance. I think the design capacity has some maintenance in it. I, 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 would, I think that's the way I recall uh, doing these kinds of things. Effective capacity <clears throat> could be if uh, the design capacity, and I would leave the design capacity based on a 24-7 operation, and look at the effective capacity based on, well, we're just ramping up the production of this. We're only running one shift five days a week. So my effective capacity would be somewhat less than the design capacity. Then we define two things. And oftentimes, you know, people bandy these words um, about almost like they're the same thing or uh, replaceable, but they're not. We're talking about efficiency and utilization. I myself am guilty of uh, mixing them up occasionally and using them as synonyms. They're both based on what you call actual output. So no matter what you said you were going to do, these are stated objectives. This is the what the designer tells you can do if you run 24-7. This is what you're claiming you can do minus the allowances you have for shift change, uh, lunch times, um, absenteeism, um, and maintenance, uh, 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 unforeseen maintenance, uh, whatever it is that stops you. you. You you might even factor in a little bit of supply delay. No one usually does, but you could do that. So this is what the manufacturer of the machinery tells you it can do 24-7. This is what you're claiming you're going to run it at in the short term. So your actual as an output is how much you're actually putting out, how much you're actually producing. So efficiency is your versus your effective capacity. It's always going to be, it's usually going to be less than or equal to this unless you establish your effective capacity wrongly or the design capacity was uh, calculated improperly. But usually your actual output is less than or equal to effective capacity and less than or equal to design capacity. So efficiency is actual output divided by effective capacity. This is what you say you're going to do. Express it as a percentage. If I said I was going to make uh, 100 uh, a day and I'm making 90 a day, your efficiency is 90%. If um, the design capacity is 300 a day, and you're only making 90 a day, which is your actual output, then your actual, your utilization is 90 divided by 300. Express it as a percent. Utilization is always less than or equal to efficiency. Why is that? Well, if we go back, we see that effective capacity is always less than or equal to design capacity. So if we look here, actual output, the numerators are the same. This will be a smaller denominator than this. This cannot, this denominator effective capacity cannot be bigger than this. Therefore, your utilization is going to be less than your efficiency. If you don't understand it, go back and reason it out and look at the, put some numbers in there and, and test it out. So efficiency is a measure of how well a line or machine is doing given your stated plan for running that line or operation. We want it to be in the high 90s. Not happy with the efficiency? Well, then we have to initiate a process improvement project. That's on you. It's not on the manufacturer. It's something that you're doing wrong. You're not preparing things properly. You have waste in the system. You have too much lag time here or there. Whatever the case is, put a small team together. The team could be as small as one. It could be as large as five to ten people to look at how to get that efficiency up. 
you want to be in the high 90s. We ever get to 100%? Sure, occasionally, but that's not, you can't guarantee that all the time because there's always unforeseen things that happen. All right, so utilization. When your utilization reaches 80%, you need to consider, notice I'm saying consider, not you must expand. You have to consider expansion to add capacity. This is more of a rule of thumb. Expansion requires presenting a plan, making a plan and presenting it to, uh, to the capital budget during the capital budgeting process, which is at the same time as a normal budgeting process, but an addendum to. This could take up to a year, depending on when in the cycle you do it. Of course, if you have, if your demand is growing rapidly, uh, you can always have, you can always get it, you know, approved quicker because it's a good thing. People want to throw money if you're meeting sales and sales are growing dramatically. But it could take anywhere from, I would say, minimum three months to certainly up to a year, depending on when in a budget cycle it happens and how pressing the need is. Ordering the machinery and tools or, you know, actually expanding a factory or building a new one and then bringing the new equipment in and installing it, testing it out and bringing it online could take up to another year. So we're talking one to two years to have an expansion online and available to you to use. So if you wait till the utilization reaches, you know, in the 90s and certainly greater than 95 percent, you risk cutting customer orders. If you lose sales, people get mad. That really gets people's attention if you start cutting sales in operations and you can't meet uh, production. Excuse me, I got a call coming in that I've got to say. Uh, I can't talk right now. Okay, so this is it. It's, it's not a guarantee you have to expand. No, you have to consider expansion. More likely than not, if things are headed in the right direction, you're going to want to expand. So here's an example. The design capacity for a warehouse loading, you know, loading and unloading is 50 trucks a day. Uh, your effective capacity with all of your uh, breaks and whatever that you're going to do at lunch times, shift changes, etc., you're only going to do 40 trucks a day. Your actual output is 36 trucks per day. So your actual output is 36. Notice that in both equations, it's the numerator. The effective capacity is 40, so you're at 90% efficiency. And actual output versus design capacity is at 72%. Notice utilization is less than efficiency. Less than or equal to, it's always the case. Now at 90%, am I happy? Well, I should be doing four more trucks a day. I have to ask the question, is there traffic to warrant four more trucks a day? Are people just waiting there and not being unloaded this day and have to be unloaded the next day? Am I turning people away? Am I taking too long? These are all things you want to look at. I'd probably want, if I was a manager, I'd want to say, okay, can we, why is it only 90%? Do we make some bad assumptions? or are we actually falling down a little bit on the job? So I would then put a process improvement team together and look at that. Then I look at my utilization and say, well, we're at 72%, I guess we're okay. But I'm gonna keep my eye on it because if that starts creeping up, when it gets to 80%, I may have to add some more doctors and hire some more people, et cetera, which is probably a good thing because that means my business is growing. So. I'm not going to do anything now. 72%, I can live with it. But is it, I'm going to keep an eye on it. As it gets closer to 80%, then we have to talk about expansion. And I might actually start thinking about some ideas and having somebody do some preliminary, nothing big, uh, you know, just some preliminary plans. If we were to expand, can we expand on this facility? Can we add new dock doors without having to add square footage to the warehouse? Can we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I might have already designed the warehouse. I know if I designed the warehouse, 
I would have, and it's in my phase one of my design, I would have had a, a design with phase two and phase three for such expansion. And then I would ask the other question. If the, if the loading dock is, is getting, uh, you know, getting that high level of utilization, how about the rest of the factory? Okay. So, yeah, this slide I'm going to just pass over because we've talked about it. Uh, now let's talk about move over from this efficiency and utilization to another concept, which is going to be called Little's Law. The average number of entities, uh, you know, throughput is what we're concerned about, how much stuff you put through a factory. This has to do with your actual output. How much stuff do you actually put through? How many cases come into a warehouse? How many cases go out? That's your throughput on a day, a week, a month, a year, however you want to measure it. Throughput in a factory is how much stuff do you make? If you're making soda cans, how many soda cans do we produce in a day? And it has to do with your, it's always outputs minus inputs. So if you're looking at the effectiveness, you've, you've brought in enough raw materials to make, you know, in a certain day, if you have enough raw materials to make uh, 10,000 cans of soda and, you, um, and your output was 10,000, well, then your throughput is like 10,000. So I want to look at that kind of thing. It's usually output minus input. So if your output should be greater than your input, if it's negative, you have negative throughput, which means you're, you're beefing up for something, hopefully, and not, uh, I would imagine a lot of companies in this COVID time had negative throughput in their factories as orders were coming in that, that were en route, but their output dribbled down to almost nothing. A bottleneck is when you have a, a specific work activity that limits the throughput of the entire process. So identifying and breaking the bottleneck processes or breaking, breaking, expanding process bottlenecks is an important part of design. Now, if I can, if I have three items in a row and I can produce a hundred an hour in the first and then that goes to the second operation that can produce 100 an hour. And then it goes to the third operation, which can only produce 60 an hour. Well, my throughput can only be 60 an hour. It's limited by the weakest chain in that link. They can only do 60 an hour. Now, how do I break that bottleneck? Usually I have to put a redundant machine there. I can expand my capacity, I can buy another machine and take my capacity there at 120. So now my throughput could be 100 in the first operation, 100 in the second operation, and in a parallel operation of two machines that do 60 each, I can do 120 an hour. So my throughput is now 100. That doesn't mean that I chase that and upgrade the other 100, the first two parts of the process up to 120. No, I'm probably gonna satisfy myself there. Or maybe I take the third machine that's only at 60 and I buy, I replace it with a more effective machine that can actually do 100 an hour. And then I've matched up everything and I have my, my, my throughput is 100% or 100 units. So let's look at a couple definitions here. We have flow time or cycle time. This is the average time it takes to complete one cycle of a process usually to produce or process one item. Throughput is the number of items or transactions, if you're talking white collar, processed in a unit of time. Work in process is how many items or transactions are being currently produced or transacted. You know, they're in process. They're waiting in line to it in a certain extent. So little is law. Flow time or cycle time is the average time it takes to complete one cycle of a process. The simple formula, there's a relationship amongst flow time, throughput, work in process, and it's this equation. Work in process equals throughput times 
flow time or processing time or cycle time. Depends on which, what kind of process you're actually doing. So whip, work in process, whip equals R times T. Now, usually in these kinds of little law problems, you're given a short story problem. You're given two out of the three of relationship or flow, T, R, and whip, basically. You have to find the third. So every problem will have you're going to use one of these equations. The original equation, whip equals r times t, or solve for t. Uh, t is equal to whip divided by r. So I'm given these two, I've got to find that one. I'm given whip and t, and I've got to find r. It's whip divided by t equals r. That's it. It's one of those three equations. But there's other curveballs we throw at. So here's the, the problem structure. One of these three is what you're going to use when you do these problems. So whip is... Here's another some tips. Whip is always in units of something being processed. It's an item or transaction being processed. It's production, it's people, it's transactions. I love that I can fix this on the fly. Throughput is always a rate. There's this word per. So units per time, people per time transactions per time. How many units are to be processed or flowing into the process in seconds, minutes, hours, days, whatever. Cycle time or flow time is the time it takes for pro to process one unit. It is time-based also, but not a rate. So this is the way you decide which is which. So, here's some curveballs that professor, I call them professorial curveballs, or the writer of story problem curveballs. You want to make sure that R and T are in the same units of time, be it seconds, minutes, etc., and in line with the units of time being asked for in what the problem wants you to calculate. It's easy to say my rate might be in hours, but I always have. Uh, this many people in the process per day. So we got hours and days. Now the formula doesn't work. They have to be the same units. And you probably want to put them in the same unit as the answer of the problem is asked for. The same applies for units. Some problems measure units one way at the beginning and then specify either R or WIP in a different unit later in the problem. So just be careful for that. Uh, professorial curveballs. So here's three problems. A voting facility processes an average of 50 people an hour. It takes 10 minutes on average to complete the voting process. What is the average number of voters in the process at any given time? How long is the line, essentially? So if a system can do 50 an hour and it takes 10 minutes on average to complete one for a person to vote, what is the average number of voters in the process? Why is there always a line? A loan department takes out an average of six it takes an average of six days to process an application. This must be like 1950s when there were no computers. And we know that on average there are 100 applications in the pipeline. What is the throughput? Well, here they've asked you, when they ask what are the number of voters in the process, they're probably asking, well, we'll get to that when we do it. But here they've actually asked for throughput. So they're looking for throughput. You might as well figure out the other two things they've given you is the rate and the whip. Or they've not given you the rate. The throughput is the rate. Excuse me. They're giving you the flow time and they're giving you the whip. Now you have to find the throughput, which is the rate. Lastly, a restaurant makes 400 pizzas per week. Each pizza uses half a pound of dough to make the crust, obviously. And the restaurant typically keeps an inventory of 70 pounds of dough. What is the average flow time? How long does it take them to make a pizza? How long is it? You know, how often are orders coming in and what is the time from to make a pizza, basically. So they've given you flow time there. So they've given you R and WIP, and you have to find it. 
So I'm asking you here now to stop the video and try to solve these problems on your own. I'm going to solve them right now, but I'm buying time so that you can actually stop the video here and try it yourself. And then come back and look at what I did and see either what you did wrong, if, you may, if we don't agree, or what I may have done wrong, which is not out of the realm of possibility. So in this case, let me move this out of the way and bring forth uh, my Excel spreadsheet and put it in the little window here. So here we have it. A voting process requires an average of 50 people per hour, and it takes 10 minutes on average to complete the voting process. So I have WIP and I have R, and I have T, which is my cycle time. What is the average number of voters in the process? Well, that's what I think what they're asking for. I think this is the question. A voting machine processes an average of 50 people per hour. So this is 50, and the units here is people per hour. And then it takes how long for a person to vote? It takes them 10 minutes. 10 minutes. All right. Here I have the two things. I got everything I need here. Let me make these a little bit bigger so you can actually see it. So I have R and T. I have to find WIP. I'm using the basic Little's Law formula. So I take 50 times 10, it's going to be 60 people in the process at any time. Yay, I'm done. So WIP equals R times T. Is that right? Let's make all this 16 so I don't have to play around with that all the time. Okay. No, no, something's wrong. Wait. Oh, no. I have people per hour, and it takes 10 minutes. Uh-oh. I have to change one of these. I have to either change this to people per minute, or I have to change this to the number of hours it takes. So it's not 500. That's wrong. I've made a mistake. Oh no. So I'm going to delete that. See what it says? People per hour, it takes 10 minutes. Flag, flag, different measures of time. Be careful. Professorial curveball. Okay, so I want to change my T to hours. Well, if it's 10 minutes divided by 60 minutes per hour will give me what? people, the processing time per hour. I guess it would be hours. So I want to, I want to use this one. Let's pull that in yellow, put that in yellow. And this one, which I, I said yellow, and I didn't use yellow. And that one in yellow. And now I want to say this equals, because I'm using this equation, whip equals r times t, times this number. And notice I have people per hour times hours. The hours cal cancel, and I will just get people. So I have an average of 8.33 people in line. What's, what's 8.33? Well, that doesn't even make sense, does it? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this. Let's make it 8.3. I don't need all those decimal places. I can make this 0.17. So there's eight people waiting in line. Eight, 
you know, some, some hours it's eight, some hours it's nine, but mostly it's eight, so it averages out to 8.3. And that would be my answer. Let's put that in a different color. Hey, there's my answer, and I'll bold it up. That's how you do that problem. All right, let's look at the loan applications. And again, I'm going to put... Uh, Let me make these all 16 so they're easier to see. And I'm going to follow the same kind of thing. I'm going to say, okay, here's WIP, here's R, here's T. Let me see which of these the problem gives me. A loan department takes an average of six days. And first of all, don't start writing stuff down. I really believe that when you do a story problem, put the pencil down. Because a lot of people start writing well, R equals this, X equals that, Y equals that, and immediately start writing wrong things and you get confused. So put your pencil down, read the story problem. If you don't understand it, read it again. If you don't understand it, read it until you do. A loan department takes an average of six days to process an application. We know that on average, there are 100 applications in the pipeline. What is the throughput? Well, thank you, problem guy. You told me what I'm solving for. So the other two have to be WIP and R. It takes an average of six days to process an application. Okay. So, oh, with throughput. I did it wrong. It's this one. R is throughput. Sorry. So what's, what's my time? What's my cycle time? Six days. What is my whip? Well, the only thing that, I mean, if that was six days, that's a time-based thing that had to be my T. My, the other thing, there's 100 applications in the pipeline at any time. There's always 100 applications on average in my system. So it's 100 applications. All right, so there I go. Now what am I solving for? R. So I have this, and I have this, and I'm doing this equation. R equals width divided by T equals whip divided by how long does it take me to process it? So it takes me an average of 16.6 .6 days to process an application? Oh my, I think I would, uh, you know, my, my, my rate is 16 applications per day. Sorry, I said that wrong. Because applications divided by days, so it's applications per day. So let me do that. Now I didn't have to worry about, there was no curveballs there about um, and let me bold this one up. Bold it and that's my problem I was trying to solve. So I could get 16.667. Do I need all those decimal places? No. I want to take it down to 1. So I can do almost 17 applications a day. Is that good? When there's 100 in the pipeline, wouldn't I want to do it faster if I could? Now I have data to look at. Do I want 100 applications waiting to be in process and I can only do 16 per day? Do I need to add another person to increase the number of applications I can do in a day and take it down? Probably I'd not want to do that. Probably what I'd want to do is have some software help to do that. So that's problem number two. Problem number three is that pizza problem. And again, I'm going to do the same thing I did over here. And the same thing I did in this problem. I want to write down the three things. I want to determine which of these equations apply. And I'm going to solve the problem. So pizza problem. Let's do the same thing. Let's make it all 16 so you can see it. 
and I have WIP, I have R, which is my rate, that's my, how many I'm processing, and then T, which is the, the, the time to process one. So, what is the flow time? Again, thank you, problem solving guy. We're in the previous one on the loan apps, we were solving for the rate per day. Now we're looking at, I wanna know how long it takes, what's, what's the process time or flow time? Okay, so, restaurant makes 400 pizzas per week. Does that look like a rate to me? Sure does. Each pizza uses five pounds of dough and the restaurant typically keeps an inventory of 70 pounds of dough. What is the average flow time? Well, the whip one is kind of hard here, but the rate is pretty easy, right? Uh, 400 pizzas per week. So it's 400 pizzas per week. Now what's with this dough thing? I have enough dough, I have 70 pounds of dough, and so is it 70 pounds? Well, I'm trying to do pizzas per week, so I've got to, how many, you know, assume I have plenty of tomato sauce, and I have plenty of sausage, pepperoni, green peppers, onions, olives, all the toppings. I have more than enough to make the amount of pizza. Let's say my limiting factor is my dough. So now I want to find out, I'm, that's going to be my, uh, is, is my limiting factor. How many pizzas worth of dough do I have? Well, I have 70 pounds of dough. But each, and it's half a pound of dough per pizza. So I divide by 0.5. And I have enough dough to make 140 pizzas, basically sitting in my refrigerator as dough. So now I want to solve for T. T equals whip divided by R. And it's not pizzas per week, it's just pizzas. I have that many potential pizzas sitting in there. Remember I said my dough was my limiting factor. That's a big assumption on my part, but we're only doing this as a, maybe you're only ordering a dough pizza, which would make it a flatbread. Okay, so T equals what? It equals Whip divided by R equals whip divided by R. So pizzas divided by pizzas per week comes out as week. What's 0.35 of a week? I don't know. I have to leave it like that because it doesn't give me any other information. That's a, almost a useless bit of how long does it take me to make a pizza, 0.35 of a week. Maybe you're only open, the pizzeria is only open uh, for carry out uh, in, in the evenings. And it is only open four hours a day. Well then, if four hours a day, seven days a week, or six days a week, then I could do a conversion to, into hours or into minutes. But right now, I gotta kinda leave it like that because I don't know how many hours are in their work week. I could do some what ifs. What if the pizzeria is open? I don't know. What do we have? Seven times 24. That's how many hours are in a week. It's not, it's not gonna be open around the clock. It's maybe if it's in New York City, that could be the case. There's 168 hours. So let's, let's go to an 80 hour work week. So at 80 hours per week, if I multiply it, uh, 
let me open that up a little bit and say, okay, so it's going to be equal to 80 times that. So it takes me 28 hours to make a pizza. That doesn't sound good. So maybe it takes me 28 hours to cycle through all of that. All of that pizza dough. That's probably a better interpretation of it. So I have enough, uh, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because I have enough dough to make 140 pizzas, and I do 140 pizzas a week. So I'm going to cycle through that inventory every, you know, 0.35 weeks, or if it's an 80-hour week, it's in 28 hours. So you have three days. And if this is, what's 35 times 7 if you work every day? So 35% of 7 equals... That times seven, seven days in a week. It comes out to, if so if we're only talking about, if you're open seven days a week, it takes him two and a half days to do it. Or if he does it this way at, at, at an eight hour a day shift in the restaurant, that's all they operate, um, it would take them um, three days. So this is pretty good. This is how you use Little's Law. I hope this helped. You're certainly going to have some problems about it. And uh, I wish you well this week. And uh, we'll probably talk about the next time we cover OM5. It'll probably be not the online book. We'll probably be talking about quality in much more detail. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you soon.